What's that? Polarization. You know. Yes, exactly. And and the attacks on all of the unions that are going on right across too. Okay, we're good. Are we ready? Uh, uh, please forgive us. I'm going to start again, and um, this won't happen hopefully the next time we do this. But anyway, um, so. The federal election campaign is going on right now, as we know, and we're hearing a lot these days about the middle class from all parties. And I can understand why, because as was prophesied a long time ago, in a capitalist system like the one that we find ourselves living in, if checks and balances are not kept clearly and maintained, the rich would get richer and the poor would get poorer. So there's an addendum to that famous saying, which I find a lot of people are forgetting, and that is that while the rich will get richer and the poor will get poorer, the middle class will slowly but surely get squeezed and eventually would be diminished. A very few, a small minority, would actually be able to make it up into the higher echelons of society and become part of the 1%, the very rich. However, at the same time, many of the middle class would find themselves slipping down to become the working poor. And this is the middle class who once were well off and comfortable without having to strive too hard. But today, what do we find even here in Nova Scotia? Many of those middle class people, they can't exist on one job anymore. They're having to find two, three jobs. And oftentimes, sadly, they're, they are minimum wage jobs. They're not even good jobs with a pension. And uh, that to me is a sign that what has been prophesied is actually happening. So we don't have to look too far to see signs of that. Um, right across North America in the UK, and in fact many major Western civilizations, this is happening. Globalization is one of the causes of this phenomenon. And as I've heard it described, by Nobel Peace Prize winning economist Joseph Stiglitz. He describes globalization as capitalism on steroids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he warns that globalization, if left unfettered, will create more poverty for many countries, not less as economists once thought. And in fact, Stiglitz says it already has and it already is. So. How do we improve life for the people of Nova Scotia, this small little peninsula on the east coast of Canada? Well, while we certainly can't forget the middle class and the struggle of the middle or working class, we also cannot forget the people already living in poverty or about the ongoing struggle for equality, sexual, gender-based, racial, and for persons living with various kinds of disabilities, including mental illness. After all, shouldn't we as new Democrats and shouldn't we as human beings care about the issue of equality, fairness, and justice for all, as we have traditionally? So I feel very lucky to be part of uh, the so-called real middle class at this point in my life anyway. Because who knows, as women get older and their lives change, many of them slip down to become the working poor and in fact the, the very poor. Um, I own my own home at this time and I should have a small pension if I ever retire, which, you know, like many others these days, seems more and more unlikely because I probably won't be able to afford to, but that's okay because as an artist, I didn't plan on retiring anyway. We didn't have, uh, we don't have very many protections as artists. We don't get unemployment insurance or employment insurance here in Canada. We, we barely have pensions to live on and most of us as artists have to live until, and work until our 80s until we drop. So as an MLA for two consecutive terms, in my writing I know that many people cannot come close to having a comfortable existence these days because they're either living in poverty already or they are Nova Scotia's working poor. So I'm sure that many of you here today actually know people in your community who cannot even afford to buy healthy food, and sometimes they and their families go hungry just so they can pay the rent. That's why I believe in food security, and I believe in good locally grown healthy food and that we need to be able to get this food into our 
hospitals, our various institutions, and into the schools for our children, for the, for the children who are coming to school oftentimes hungry. So that's why, unfortunately, many people in Nova Scotia today and around Canada, really, have to rely on food banks, which, although they're doing a great service, uh, should not, in my estimation, even have to exist in this day and age. Why can't our government make sure that people and their children do not go hungry? If poor countries like Cuba, for instance, can give children two meals a day at school, why can't we? I suggest that the province itself needs to implement a breakfast and lunch program for children, all children attending public schools in Nova Scotia. Let's give our children a chance to start out on the right foot. Let's give them the boost that they need to be healthy, no matter what their economic situation is at home. And that's something that I would definitely advocate for as leader of the NDP. Now, as our federal NDP counterpart is promising, better health care would definitely help all Canadians. $15 a day child care will help women get back into the workforce and even a $15, a 15 an hour minimum wage will help the working class as well as post-secondary students. And it may also help those who are soon to be pushed off welfare and into the workforce whether they like it or not under potential changes to Nova Scotia's ESIA program. However, it will not help the poorest of the poor who live in a shelter, those who can't find a job, affordable housing, those who simply can't work because they have serious health issues or are disabled. And it will do little to strengthen the bottom rung of our social safety net, our provincial income assistance programs. Under the previous NDP government, we did introduce two major initiatives, an affordable housing strategy and a mental health strategy. However, the current Liberal government seems to have dropped both like hot potatoes, mm -hmm. just as they have almost everything that the NDP has touched or introduced. And they've reversed much of our legislation as well, including that designed to help labor with collective bargaining and first contracts for those wishing to unionize. Shame. Shame. Yes, Ida. Yes. In, in, <laughs> instead of developing a proper affordable housing program and creating a better system of living for people with mental illness or our seniors, this government seems to have taken a page out of the George Book handbook, the George Bush Republican handbook. Ever since coming into power, they've been focused on cutting and gutting programs that are in place to help those in need, while at the same time they're privatizing everything they can get their hands on. And trust me, folks, they're going to keep doing that. I can see the future, and it is not pretty under this liberal government that we currently have. Unions are in trouble. They want to, they want to bash unions and break them up, and they want to privatize everything, including home care. Uh, so I'm extremely concerned about the future of the province if this government continues to stay in power. They've lost no time in cutting some organizations completely. As I said earlier, they've now cut the funding for the hearing impaired, for the lobby group for the hearing impaired, so now they're not going to be able to exist. And there are many other organizations, NGOs like this, that are now going to be struggling and probably will have to just give up and close up their offices. Um, they also gutted and closed up an organization that was doing very well here in Nova Scotia, which was our highly successful agency, the Film and Creative Industries Nova Scotia Agency, which was specifically designed to help our many arts <coughs> organizations, as well as our screen industry, grow and flourish. And it had been doing a successful job doing that and building that sector, from one which brought in $6 million to Nova Scotia's economy, to one that last year brought in $150 million. Well, this year, Thanks to the now infamous fiasco of gutting our one major incentive for growth, the film tax credit, we'll be lucky if Nova Scotia uh, attracts even half of the investment that we already did last year. Shame! As far as I'm concerned, shame! And, and the effects of that are now becoming clear as more and more businesses that are associated with the creative economy are closing up and moving to Ontario and further west. 
um, many of the artists are being affected as well. Some of them, even if they had a few days on a film or a television here or there, it would be enough for them to then go and do a really nice theater gig because theater, as we know, doesn't pay very well. So we need a balance of all of the different creative economy, the different mediums and venues out there for us to be successful in this province. Personally, I believe the way forward for Nova Scotia is to reestablish a competitive film tax credit. Now, by the time we get back in government, it may be different from the one we had. It may be better, it may, it may be bigger, it may be less, it may be done with some other things in place, but we need to improve it because right now it's not competitive and we can't compete with the rest of the country. We also need to build a film sound stage to attract bigger films and TV series so we can have TV sh series shooting all year long here in Nova Scotia. And instead of cuts... Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Please join us for an author reading with meteorologist Cindy Day. Oh Cindy will be reading from her book, <laughs> Grandma Says, Weather Lord for Meteorologist Cindy Day. Yeah. Everyone is welcome to <laughs> Thank you. I, I, her outfits, I'm sorry, like she's probably a really nice person, but her outfits are outrageous. Like, <laughs> I'm a fashion person, and I'm like, oh, you're oh you're my you're gosh. Good. Well, we'll be there, well, that's 10 minutes, so I might be done by then. Okay, <laughs> to, to continue. Um, personally, I believe the way forward for Nova Scotia is to reestablish a competitive film tax credit to build a film sound stage to attract bigger films and TV series so that they can shoot all year long. And instead of cuts, invest more money directly into the arts and into the creative economy yes. by increasing the budget to arts, to culture, and to heritage, which are three completely different things. Oftentimes they'll try and lump it all into one, but they're not, they're different. The arts and culture and heritage are all very important parts of our creative economy here in Nova Scotia and we need to support them all as far as I'm concerned. This will not only help our many professional artists and tal talented artisans, but it will also, if done with imagination and vision, I believe it will also help our tourism industry. And as I said earlier before I started my, my speech, that is I think uh, also a very, very important aspect of Nova Scotia which is falling behind. By the way, the government did cut and gut the tourism department, so it's gone now. So I don't know what they're thinking there, because we need to increase our tourism, not, not just let it go by the wayside. I also believe in supporting uh, a knowledge-based economy. They call it the knowledge-based economy of the 21st century, which includes IT and post-secondary education. And to this end, I support the academics who say that academic freedom has been compromised in this province by recent legislation introduced by the current Liberal government. I also support the students' movement who've been asking that student loans be turned into grants. Why should our students come out of university drowning in debt? How does that help strengthen our economy or encourage young people to stay in this province when many of them will head out west to get higher paying jobs to pay off their debt? I've heard this over and over again. They, they come out of school drowning in debt. They go, well, I'm going to have to go out west. How else am I going to pay it off? Well, that's not what we want. We want to keep them here. Put down roots. Let's give them a, a, an opportunity to feel that they are appreciated here, they are valued, that we want their young, bright mind, and we want them to stay here in Nova Scotia. I also say that we need to invest in the green economy and in green jobs. Recent studies show that there are now more jobs associated with the green economy in the tar sands region in Alberta than there are jobs related to fossil fuels. We're perfectly situated here in Nova Scotia to create jobs that harness the wind, the waves, and solar energy, the sun, and it will help us do our part to save our planet from the dangers and destruction being brought about by global warming. And I cannot tell you how much I feel that there needs to be more discussion in our province and in our party about addressing the and mitigating climate change because when every major recognized and respected climate expert tells us that we all need to make serious changes to the way we live and do business around the world, I'd say to borrow from the Ivany report, it's now or never. Now 
or never. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Today there will be board games available from 2 to 5 in the RBC Learning Lab on the third floor. They didn't tell Everyone us about this welcome. when we booked this room. <laughs> okay. Um, when it comes to uh, helping Nova Scotians to live a better life, I support an increase in income assistance. I support the development of a national pharmacare program that could help many people get the drugs that they need. I also support dental coverage mm -hmm. for all ages, not just for children. Right now we have it up to age 14 and our NDP government was going to introduce it to keep extending it up to age 17, which didn't happen because this new liberal government threw that into the dustbin. But I support dental care for all ages, including our seniors, because I feel that that is part of our health care. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is definitely part of your health. If you have um, uh, uh, rotting teeth and, and bad uh, need root canals, this is going to really be expensive, and many people can't afford it. So I think that we need to help people with their dental coverage. And um, I believe that oral hygiene and oral health should be accepted as part of, of the overall health plan. In my six years as MLA, I've seen just how badly we need a plan like this to help people with dental assistance, especially our seniors, because right now I believe the system is failing them. I also support the movement towards a system that I experienced personally in Sweden when I lived and worked in Stockholm there in the 1980s a guaranteed living wage or annual guaranteed annual income. This is a long held belief among social democrats, many people in our party, and even the Social Workers Association of Canada has now come out in favor of this system as the best way to eradicate poverty in our country. For many years it seemed that the right, uh, the conservative right, were against this and saying, oh, it's socialism and oh, how terrible a thing this is. But really, let's look at it. It would, it would take the place of income assistance. It would take the place of employment assurance, insurance. It would look after people in between their jobs. And instead of being able to say, oh, look, there are the welfare bums, all oh, those welfare bums. No, everybody has welfare. Everybody, ha it's a system whereby everybody is looked after by their government and everybody gives back to their community because they want to. From day one, when children are born in Sweden and in the Scandinavian countries, they're taught to be proud of what you do, to, to find a craft, to find something that gives you joy, that you want to do for a living and be proud of it. And then you do that and you give back to your community because your community is looking after you. It's about we and us, not I and me. It's not about who wants to marry a millionaire, who wants to be a millionaire. All of these things, these false things that keep being pounded into our brains from the United States, all these terrible television shows, you know, that, that are basically brainwashing our young, I think, and us too, because so many people watch them. So instead of that, let's, let's try and change the dialogue to what can we do together to look after our own society and each other. So finally, um, I have to say, I am also pragmatic, however, and I do realize that everything can't be done overnight. Uh, the public needs to be engaged and educated about how and why this system actually works, how it works in Sweden and Scandinavia, the other social democratic <coughs> countries, because I think once people actually understand it, they will embrace it. When I go into schools and I talk to young kids about my days as an actress, my days as a politician, and traveling the world and, and getting to know different political systems, I talk about my time in Sweden, and I, I describe that system to them. And every time I talk about it, kids say, oh, that sounds good, why can't we have that here? And I say, we can, we just have to want it enough. So, you know, I think that the appetite is there for people who are ready to listen to this stuff. But, you know, we need to be able to approach it in a way that people will understand. Finally, I'm also concerned about the kind of world we are leaving for our grandchildren. I care deeply about all children, and I believe that our province needs to create a specific plan to address and mitigate climate change. And I can assure you that this is going to be one of the biggest global issues in our lifetime. So let's get on top of it now instead of waiting for others. 
I support David Suzuki's Blue Dot Movement, which is asking governments to introduce legislation to acknowledge that clean air, water, and soil are a human right. And this is a bill that I would very much like to introduce in Nova Scotia. As leader of the NSNDP, I can guarantee that I would be prepared to make specific commitments to address and mitigate climate change in Nova Scotia based on the resolutions that come out of the Paris Climate Change Summit later this year. And I would also commit to guaranteeing that I would uh, want to work towards eradicating poverty in this province. I would also want to uh, prepare to rebuild and rejuvenate the creative economy, which includes all of the arts as well as our screen sector. I'd like to put an emphasis on women and children, which are often sadly the face of poverty in our province and around the world. And I can guarantee that I'm prepared to stand for peace in a world gone crazy with hatred, anger, and war. Finally, I can guarantee that as leader, I would be ready, willing, and able to commit my life to our party, to fight for what we believe in, and commit my life to the people of Nova Scotia to, to work for the things that will strengthen our province as well. Without compromising the NDP's cherished core social democratic values, which I believe are vital for building a better world. And that's why my campaign, Lenore for Leader, is not just a campaign. We're building a movement. Thank you.